Okay, I think we'll just start and uh, Nathaniel will join us um, in, in uh, hopefully not too long. Uh, good morning, everybody, and good afternoon. I'm presuming that uh, the people in the countries can hear us. So good afternoon or evening, uh, wherever you are. Good morning in Washington, D.C. Uh, my name is Robert Hunja. I work at the World Bank Institute. I have the, the honor, I shall insist, of chairing this session. But uh, I'm, I'm going to be helped also by Nicola, uh, who will be speaking in a little while. Um, we have quite a number of, uh, of participants who will, be, um, who will be speaking. So I think we'll just get going um, so that we can be able to cover everything we intend to cover in the morning. Um, the event has a number of purposes. Uh, one is obviously to, to hear from from the panelists and the participants about how Very good. Uh, uh, on, on their views about how to boost fiscal transparency. This is an agenda, as we all know, that has been going on for a long time. I think it's getting a, a, a second boost for a couple of reasons, including work that's going on in the OGP, the portal will be launching this morning, the work the IBP and others do. So we'll be hearing uh, about you know, kind of challenges and opportunity in the fiscal transparency <laughs> arena. Obviously, also uh, formally launched the portal this morning, uh, and we would also want to hear uh, from the participants and yourselves how you think this portal can help kind of push the fiscal transparency agenda forward. Uh, so those are kind of the, the dual purposes of, of, of this morning. Uh, the event is sponsored by ourselves at the World Bank Institute, the ODI, the Overseas Development Institute, and uh, the Community of Practice on Fiscal Transparency, which is anchored here uh, in the bank. Um, what I'll do rather than go through the whole agenda right now is just uh, begin by hearing from two uh, colleagues of ours. One is Nicola Smithers, and Nicola will just briefly introduce herself uh, before she starts her presentation. And then as we go on, we'll be able to introduce the other, the other speakers as we go along. Uh, is that okay? Nicola, shall we begin? Thanks. Thank, thank you. Um, Good afternoon, uh, good evening, good morning uh, to those uh, colleagues. I'm um, delighted to be joining this um, sort of uh, global discussion. Um, and thanks to the Boost team um, for organizing and putting in place this, um, um, this important launch event. Um, um, I, mean, I, I was asked um, to speak about sort of challenges and opportunities, and I, mean, I think that could be quite a long discussion. I don't want to go have a long discussion because we've got many speakers who will be able to speak, talk to this point in great, uh, with great interest and great depth. So, um, but I would like to flag two, um, I think, key challenges around fiscal transparency. I think the, the first is um, the extent and the quality of transparency uh, regarding fiscal issues, budget spending. Um, in terms of the content, the form in which it is, it is provided, uh, the ease by which it can be accessed, and so on. The second issue um, is around making transparency count from a broader development sense, um, for making it count for participation, accountability, uh, better budget outcomes, better development results. Um, but moving on then, how far have we gotten? In this, in this endeavor so far. Um, uh, I mean, I think um, if we can point to a couple of useful sources just to give us an overview here. Um, the IBP's open budget um, survey of 2012, um, we found that um, over the, the six years plus that uh, they have been undertaking the survey since 2006, um, the average score has risen. It's risen from 47 to 57. So overall, we have seen some increase um, in performance. Um, and there are a number of countries have made quite significant pro uh, progress recently, Honduras, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and so on. However, at, at the same time, the pace of improvement has slowed for the original 40 that were assessed. Um, and, and in some cases, countries have, have been slowing down or, or, even, or even falling back. And, you know, and as we stand today, about we're saying about 23 countries are providing extensive or significant information um, uh, in accordance with the, the, the survey's definition of eight, eight key documents. Um, I should also mention that the bank has undertaken um, a survey, a survey last year, um, of um, um, the extent to which um, um, 
open budget data be is being made um, available in a timely way um, based on or being derived from financial management information systems. So this is, this is in a sense, at, um, pushing the boundary further in, um, uh, in terms of not simply producing uh, periodic documents that are put on a website, but the extent to which they're regularly being, uh, information is being regularly provided directly from the FMIS. Um, and then 23 of 198 economies are doing this at the moment. Um, so so we've, the progress is mixed and, um, uh, you know, that significant challenges still remain around disclosure of information and, and in forms that then can be readily used. Um, in terms of the second challenge, I think I mean, we'll all be aware that um, it's one thing to publish information, to provide information, put information out there, uh, necessarily, though that clearly is. Um, but another is another thing for that information to be, be being used by citizens and other stakeholders, to engage with government, um, to have it contribute to institutions and mechanisms for accountability, um, for government responsiveness, um, and for improving public spending and so on. So, um, the recent study by uh, Kagram, Dorenzio, and Fung um, indicates that um, while there are um, countries that have been, in, uh, you know, a significant number who have, have been improving transparency. There are fewer current countries in which one can see um, progress further down that results chain, so that, that are then able to um, effectively engage and support participation in the use of that data um, and to translate that into accountability. So the challenges, that, that's a very, very sweeping and broad statement of the challenges, on the opportunities, what then of opportunities? Um, I'm going to flag one important dimension, but by no means um, all, all, of the issue, all of the opportunities I think that are there. But the one I'm going to flag is around the global agenda. Um, I mean, there, there has been a, a pretty rapid and um, significant um, elevation of this, the topic of fiscal transparency in the global agenda. Um, we, uh, it was part of the, um, uh, the declaration from the June um, uh, G8 conference, which specifically referred to um, public information around budgets, amongst other things. Um, of course, the Open Government Partnership with over 60 countries, um, and the majority of those members have made commitments um, in one way or another that relate to fiscal transparency. Um, and indeed, there are more technical efforts underway. Um, the Global Initiative for Fiscal Transparency is a, a, you know, a leading global um, initiative, and what's very interesting about that initiative is that it brings together governments, civil society organizations, um, international finance institutions, donors, um, uh, which is pushing to um, strengthen the and, and harmonize international standards, um, and as well as um, uh, contributing to improving the in, uh, understanding of incentives and and the evidence of impact, two important parts of this equation, um, as well as supporting peer-to-peer -peer exchange through the Open Government Partnerships Fiscal Openness Working Group that was recently launched. Um, and there are many other, um, and, and then there are many other um, global initiatives. Sorry. Thank you. And there are many, there are many other um, global initiatives um, um, that are out that are, that are underway and, and pushing for um, improvements in transparency, participation, monitoring in a range of um, different aspects of the broad what I can put put as the broad fiscal transparency arena. Um, so what then of um, uh, boost? I mean, what, what, but what I would say perhaps is that, I mean, we have these, these global efforts are taking place. The, the, there is a high level of um, um, awareness, I think, um, and attention to this issue. Um, I should mention that the Global Initiative for Fiscal Transparency um, um, high-level principles were endorsed by the UN General Assembly, for example. Um, but, the, you know, so we have an opportunity here, but we need to grasp it. And I think that, that um, the, the Open Budgets portal is one, one way in which we're seeking to grasp that opportunity. Um, and then 
uh, in that regard, um, I think there's a couple of um, ways. I mean, the Boost is, is providing us with a comprehensive data set. I think it's about making uh, the most of the data that is available um, from government financial management systems, which at the moment often is, is not being accessed and used for analytic purposes um, to, in order to improve uh, expenditure analysis. I mean, and I would say that, flag that, that firstly, that's within government. You know, at the, at the first order of, of public expenditure analysis is, is within government. That's a very important way in which, which the boost databases are contributing. Um, and that we, that, you know, delivering better public spending is, 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 is significantly dependent on that process of better public expenditure analysis. Um, and secondly, of course, it provides the means for a more accessible and usable data to be made available to the public. Um, uh, and so the Boost database provides a real opportunity for a substantial improvement in what's possible from public spending data uh, and that's being picked up by systems. So, um, and, in, and in thinking about Boost in that regard, I mean, I think uh, it's, it's well understood that the, we know a, front, a frontier issue around that is the use um, of that data, how, and that, as we go forward in thinking about how to ensure and enable effective use of the data to advance us down this uh, results chain. And I'll close there. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Nicola. Um, hopefully, we'll have an opportunity to get some reaction to some of the, of the information that Nicola shared with us. Uh, we're very glad that uh, Nathaniel is able to join us this morning. So welcome, Nathaniel. <laughs> welcome. Uh, do you want to just take it on and maybe just give us a few words of introduction? Tell us who you are, what you do. Yeah. Um, no, happy to. I'm very, very sorry for coming in late. Um, but I left late, and then I also got lost in the building, which mm. happens. Um, so apologies to, to Massimo and, and Robert and Nicola and everybody else here. Um, and to those online, hello. Uh, so I was asked to just try and frame some of this work in the broader context of sort of uh, what's new and hot in the global transparency community. For those that don't know, I'm Nathaniel Heller. I work at Global Integrity, which is an international NGO that works on issues of, of transparency and accountability writ large. And we're big cheerleaders and fans of fiscal transparency work generally and budget transparency more narrowly. Um, so this is really exciting. And I think the... The, the sort of moment now of putting a lot of these data online is kind of, I would imagine, for those that were in the trenches, a sort of cathartic um, exercise in sort of liberating a lot of, of hard-earned data and, and scraping and work that was done to sort of pull this together. Uh, for those that have never done this kind of work, um, it's really awfully hard. It's not technically uh, sort of rocket science, but the level of effort that's required to, to go in and standardize, to clean, to code, and to structure these kinds of data is very, very non-trivial, even with all of the software and the sort of automated techniques we have. And you know, it's a, um, a huge credit to the teams that have been working on this in a number of countries to get it to where it is today, to be able to put it online and have it to be rel you know, relatively searchable and findable and, and accessible. So just a big congratulations. Um, just to pick up, so I have just a, a couple of very brief comments and then I'll, I'll stop. Um, to pick up on one of Nicola's last points, I think the, it's very, very true that um, there's been a huge explosion and the sort of time has come for fiscal transparency writ large. And it's not just about the sort of data exercises and the open data elements of that, but just more generally, the norm is, I would think, really emerging around the need and the value and the impact of, of fiscal and budgetary transparency. And this is not just a southern country problem or a developing country issue. This is also sort of emerging, I think, very quickly within the OECD countries. So there's a really I think need opportunity now, and, and we heard about a number of the initiatives, many of which have been born in the last three to five years, not many of them are older. So this explosion of interest and political capital that's now being invested in a number of places and a number of fora is quite real, and I think this is a great moment. Um, if we had done this exercise five years ago, I suspect you'd be sort of uh, screaming into the darkness trying to get some attention around this, so it's a really... I think powerful moment to, to be able to provide these tools and then to put some political and other um, capital behind it to really look at impact and, impact and uptake. Which is a segue to a second point. One of the early lessons from a lot of uh, both similar and, and slightly different attempts to um, put data out there through portals and through tools is that if you build it, they won't necessarily come. And so this is gonna be an interesting challenge to watch in this now, what I would sort of characterize as a second generation of open data efforts, is what, what does it take and what is the cocktail of conditions that's required to translate all this great new information into some sort of downstream impact and uptake? And, and Nicola was mentioning some of the, the international budget partnership studies that were 
put out a few months ago, the, the real, the simple and powerful and important headline there is we don't really know how this stuff translates into service delivery outcomes, which is good or bad depending on sort of where you sit. Um, if you come at this from more of a sort of rights-based approach, it's kind of like, okay, so that's unfortunate, but we still think there's intrinsic value in this work and we're going to continue to do it. If you need for mandate or other reasons to prove service delivery impact and return on investment, you're in a trickier spot. And this is going to be, there's going to be a lot of interesting work to be done to try and draw these stories out. We have anecdotal stories. It was literally narratives and stories of people and places where this has led, and you'll probably hear about it um, in a few minutes, where this has led to material change. And those are great. So either we need more stories or we need some more cutting edge work on the analytical front to be able to, if not prove, but at least substantiate the argument that this is worth the effort. Because it is real effort. And you'll, I'm sure we'll hear about sort of the, <laughs> the real effort that went into to doing all of this data work. Um, so I would sort of watch for that. Um, the, the huge instructive lessons that we have to go on come from a, a small number of countries, but they're very powerful. I mean, we'll hear, I think, about the Moldovan experience, which I think is generally positive. We have emerging lessons from the Kenya experience around open data, which are a little bit less positive right now. They may, that may turn the corner a bit. Um, and even in the OECD countries, there's a lot of concern around the lack of uptake for around things like data.gov or data.gov.uk. Um, and that, that doesn't mean we shouldn't be doing this, but I think learning those lessons and at least not making the same mistakes would be good. We can make new mistakes, that's completely fine, but not making the same mistakes. The core mistake was build it and they will come. We know that's not enough. Um, so how to solve the, the kind of build it and they will come, uh, it's not simple or automatic, but w there is enough research to, and sort of just practitioner experience to suggest there's a couple different solutions. One is to really be honest about the important role of, in, of intermediaries and infomediaries. Um, there's some really good work that was done three or four years ago by Arkong Fung and others looking at similar style interventions and were the ones that did work were ones that involved very old school leveraging of media, of NGOs and others um, to translate this vast amount of very dense information into stories and insights that matter to people, right? So my mother is very unlikely to go onto this open data portal and surf around and sort of look at 7 million lines of itemized budget codes. But if there's a story in local media about why books aren't showing up in the local school, that's going to resonate with a lot more people. And that's really common sense, but it's also really tricky and takes a lot of thoughtful planning and some tactics to get that sort of potential downstream impact and resonance. So the role I would continue to look for sort of how do we bring in intermediaries and infomediaries to sort of use that cliche in a way that helps to take really raw but well-structured information and turn it into something that actually matters in terms of insights. And to also not fool ourselves into thinking that the stuff that just jumps out of the page at you when you stare at the screen, it actually doesn't often. It really takes some experienced set of hands that has probably done this before. I think one of the huge missed opportunities is, is glossing over the potential for bringing in a lot of the computer, what's used to be called the computer assisted reporting community globally and now has sort of a new term of art. But there's a bunch of data journalists out there around the world increasingly that know how to do really good journalism around these kinds of data sets and who can draw out the stories um, and I think there's just some nice linkages that we probably collectively as a community haven't been taking advantage of. Um, and then a second sort of modality or, or option is to sort of look at more of a, I don't know what the right way to frame this is, a sort of communi community driven process for mobilizing and activating just interested, smart, and typically professional, but sort of lay users around these issues. And Anders Pedersen is here from Open Spending. It's one example of how one can recruit and activate and maintain communities of folks that donate time and effort around telling these stories and scraping these data and putting these databases together and actually doing something with them and, and trying to mobilize. So, I mean, that's, that's one very powerful example. There are some others. So I think it's, you know, the, the short way of summarizing that messiness is whether it's through kind of professional intermediaries and intermediaries and or communities of stakeholders that actually care about this stuff that aren't just people we recruit off the street with the promise of a free lunch at a workshop or something, but actually have some sort of built-in vested interest. I think that's our best shot at getting some downstream uptake and sustainability around these things. Um, last but not least, the we were in a, a very separate meeting yesterday with Nicola. The comment I made I think is relevant um, to this conversation is to watch out a bit for the trap or the myth of this sort of um, uh, the mythology that's been built up around evidence-based policymaking as an automatic byproduct of finally having good information. And I think if we look at the, the just in the last several years, the huge amount of really terrible decisions made in OECD economies, for example, um, we had a lot of really good information, a lot of transparent data out there. 
Um, politics and power still matter incredibly importantly in a lot of places. And so while these kinds of tools and data sets um, take us a huge leap forward, they do not automatically guarantee really smart, intelligent public policy outcomes. And that seems, again, really common sense, but I think a lot of us, myself included, tend to gloss over this. Even if you have it and you have those great stories and you get in the room and you have the prime minister or the minister's ear for two hours to preach the gospel around why we should be spending more on clinics and not um, defense frigates, it doesn't mean they're still not going to buy the frigates. And it has nothing to do with the quality of your information. It has nothing to do with availability of the information. It has a whole lot to do with power, politics, and special interests. And so just to be, not, it's not easy to solve that at all, but just to be mindful of that I think is important so that we're not setting ourselves up or partners and stakeholders up for failure or for disappointment when we don't get the perfect outcomes that we think from the outside you know, should be there. So let me stop there and turn it back to Robert. Well, thanks, Anna, for very thoughtful comments. Uh, again, hopefully we'll come back and, and chat a little bit about this. Um, at this point, Massimo is going to spend a few minutes telling us about the portal itself. So, Massimo? Yeah. First of all, I'd like to welcome everyone uh, for being here and uh, despite the proximity to the holidays and uh, probably sacrificing Christmas shopping just to hear about some boring data and so I hope I'll make that worthwhile. And obviously also thank all our guests that are connected uh, internationally from uh, Kampala, Chisinau and uh, London. We look forward to hearing uh, from you guys. Uh, to me, uh, this event uh, marks sort of the, the culmination of a journey that, that started about over three years ago when, uh, along with uh, Dino Merotto, Igor Kaifetz, and Lars Sondergaard, we launched the Boost Initiative because, as I hope I'll make it very clear during the presentation, this portal embodies all the principles that have been guiding that initiative from, from the start. And in particular, the uh, realization, the fundamental premise that uh, by making data more accessible in consolidated, timely, reliable, uh, and granular formats, we can, uh, can go a long way towards ensuring a higher quality of expenditure analysis. And I, and I, I hope I'll be, I'll be able to make uh, that case uh, quite clearly. And, and basically, the portal is an extension of that initial principle because we just seek to uh, make data available not only within and across countries, but also to civil society organizations and global organizations. I think we're happy, we're fortunate today to have speakers that solely, fully represent the, the whole spectrum of these stakeholders, and we're very uh, eager to hear from them about their impressions and their thoughts on how this database can, uh, uh, can be helpful to them. Um, first, let me just start by uh, this number here. Uh, this is not a, a countdown to the new year, uh, but it actually has a more symbolic meaning. It, it is the number of million of line items data that is being disseminated today. So 15, around 15 million row uh, line item data, of expansion data, revenue data has been released today. We have many more that will be incorporated in coming weeks as more countries are already lined up uh, to join. So this gives us a sense of one is the vastness of the data liberation that is taking place, but two is also, it's also a caveat because it obviously we will require a lot of data handling and sophistications in, in order to, to make sense of this data. And I think one of the challenges that collectively we have to pick up is how do we move from dissemination of raw data to making sure that this data can be in the hands of those users that might not really have the capacity to absorb this data, but they will be the ones that with the right hands, with the right data, they can really make a, a difference and they can make a strong use. I think that's one of the main challenges uh, that we want to look at. Um, the presentation is basically structured around four key questions. So we're going to ask the why. So why are we launching this portal and what is the rationale uh, for doing that? The how is uh, how does a country get in here? Because the question might ask why are these countries in here and not other countries? We want to make sure that we clarify what are the principles of this portal, why we think that those principles are important to be applied uniformly. The what is basically just saying what is being disseminated. Uh, and, uh, and obviously data is a major component. It's not the only component. And finally, the who is about uh, which country is initially in this launch. But rather than just going through a list of countries, what we'll do is so we're going to 
uh, choose a subset of countries and, and sort of demonstrate some actual applications that have been done with this tool, just to give a flavor of the analytical possibilities that, that building a, this platform has allowed us to do so that now more users can actually uh, draw inspiration from it. Uh, in terms of the why, uh, I, I could have had a longer list, but I think these four uh, sum up uh, mostly the, uh, the rationale. Uh, the first is to really give visibility to country efforts. And uh, the reason for this is because a lot of the countries that are featured here, it is true that they are shown and placed in a more user-friendly formats, but they also draw from the fact that a lot of these countries have actually done efforts in order to already advance fiscal transparency, but these efforts sometimes are, are just, uh, they, they go unnoticed for a lot of reasons. Let's take uh, Armenia. How many uh, people are actually were aware of the fact that the Ministry of, of Finance in Armenia has been publishing and visualizing expenditure data for quite a few years. Of course, one of the problem, the low profile of the website and the fact that it's in Armenian might have certainly contributed to the fact that not many people were aware of it. Um, uh, not long time ago, Paraguay um, uh, set up to work with us on, 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 on the Boost Initiative, and in a very short turnaround, we were able to, to move from a situation in which it was very hard to get a handle of the data, especially the municipal level data, to actually implement this, this user-friendly web-based interface that disseminates data over an horizon of 10 years. Uh, now and it really shows that when there is a will, there's a way. And and but but again, this information is provided in, in, in Spanish, and not every uh, users might be uh, familiar enough. Um, a similar case was uh, um, on with Togo, which actually was the first country where we implemented this web-based interface. And I think Togo also is a it's a very uh, interesting case because it shows that that exploring these new frontiers of fiscal transparency is not just the prerogative of rich countries. Uh, if there is a will, this can be implemented in any case. And I think uh, Togo offers a lot of, uh, of good lessons for us. And I'll actually come back to it during the presentation as well. Once again, this portal is managed by the Togolese government in French, but we also make sure that the same information is available in English on our portal so that we have a uniform language that can be used by, by um, major uh, global organizations as well as in country civil society organizations and governments. Now, if I go back to the why, um, and we move on to the, to the second point, the advanced global knowledge. Well, I think I already hinted what are some of the bottlenecks. Sometimes it's very hard to navigate websites of the ministers of finance. For one reason, it's the linguistic barriers, but there are actually other, other reasons as well. And by placing everything in one place, uh, uh, in both English and the local language, and by making that accessible in consolidated formats, I think uh, uh, it goes a long way towards ensuring that there is a much stronger use by organizations like the ones we're going to hear from London, for instance, uh, on how this sudden availability of data can be translated into uh, new frontiers, research topics, and advocacy. Uh, we heard from both uh, Nicola and Nathaniel about how timely this is in terms of the fiscal transparency agenda, because uh, obviously, in, in the past decade, we've seen a swelling and proliferation of fiscal transparency initiatives uh, on which we want to build upon. I think this portal has one opportunity to further elevate the quality of these discussions, and that is by this emphasis on the quality of data, the, on data integrity issues and on the quality of dissemination of the data, which is it is important to focus on accessibility and usability of data. And, and that is sort of goes hand in hand with, the, with, with some of the boost principles that I will be describing shortly. So we think that there is a place for the portal to also influence these discussions. And in particular, if we manage to, to demonstrate the impact of placing data in more user-friendly format and see, does that really create a difference on public participation, on the way that civil society organization can access and use data to advance public participation in the budget process? And last but not least, we want to motivate other actions, other countries into actions. Uh, we feel this is no longer an isolated one or two countries doing this. We have now uh, around 15 countries being disseminated and featured here. Uh, we think that this is already a sufficient critical mass to get other countries uh, to emulate these efforts. And uh, our informal goal is really to get at least 50 developing countries by 2015. This is a, a very symbolic date. It will be the end of the first phase of the MDGs. There will be a lot of uh, work uh, around trying to, to, to look at how the policies have been implemented, what has been the costing and financing um, opportunities. And so having access to a lot of data can certainly enhance the quality of those uh, 
uh, of those analyses. So this is something that, that uh, this is a goal that we set ourselves. Of course, these four dimensions are very related to each other. If we manage to give visibility to the countries and we try to document the positive impact of this, this is likely to get other countries uh, into actions. And similarly, if we are able to explore new frontiers and expenditure analysis, that is likely to really inform in the fiscal transparency agenda and in turn motivate more actions, more countries into action. So we want to really follow all four dimensions simultaneously because they're equally, uh, they're equally relevant. Um, on the how question, I think here we want to answer the question, so, you know, why, why do we pick these countries as opposed to other countries that might also uh, you know, being features in this portal, and we want to make those principles very clear and why we think that these principles are important. Well, on one hand, you know, uh, commitment and endorsement to transparency from the government was essential, uh, and uh, that has happened at different levels. I mean, in, in countries like Peru, with, with a record of over 10 years of transparency, or in countries like Moldova and Kenya, where there's been a, a recent push for open data initiative, uh, uh, the, the endorsement was easier to acquire because it didn't really require a lot of formalization given the fact that, that all this data was already in the public domain, but uh, nevertheless, we have had constant interactions with our counterparts. In the majority of countries, what we've done is we've uh, proactively sought uh, the endorsements of our counterparts. In many cases, we asked the country to actually review their pages and suggest content as well so that they will feel empowered and also have some ownership on, on, the, on this tool. And we're happy to see that a lot of countries have actually answered back to us and say that they really approve the initiatives and they want to see more coming out of this uh, data dissemination, and we're committed to, to do that. Um, the other aspect is, of course, is the boost process. A and what that means is basically is that in order for, for a country to be featured here, the main, the key word here is, uh, is usability, accessibility, which means that we want the user to feel comfortable that this data can be immediately used uh, because he has gone through a certain uh, uh, process, a vetting process, and because it has certain characteristics. So every country that is featured in this portal has gone through what we call the boost process, right? Which, which basically means that has uh, very timely information. Every country has data until 2012. Other, some, some countries even until preliminary 2013 data. They all have at least five or six years of comparable consistency time series. Actually, in the majority of cases, that spans over a decade. I would say about half of the countries are now at least 10 years of data that can be analyzed almost consistently over time. Uh, the second dimension is comprehensiveness. So at the very least, we want to ensure that all levels of government are represented there. Now, we, we know that a lot of times some national data is not as easy to capture, especially on the execution side, than, 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 than central spending. And sometimes they're not even captured in the, in, in the treasury system. They're stored somewhere else. So in, all the, in every country, we've done the effort of including some national spending, which obviously can offer a lot of insights in terms of service delivery and also intergovernmental uh, uh, relationships. Comprehensiveness also refers to the fact that we always include all the sectors, so this is never just one or two sectors, but includes all the sectors. And in a growing number of cases, we are not only capture expenditures, but we also capture the revenue side on it, which is becoming, which is really gaining a political momentum. So we want to be sure to riding that momentum as well. The third component is the granularity. So we try to capture the information at the most disaggregated level that a chart of accounts allows. This is very important because, uh, as I'm sure we'll be hearing from London and, and, uh, and from our colleagues in London, is the more granular the data, the, the higher the quality of the expenditure analysis. And I will provide some example of what exactly means. Uh, but what it basically implies is that we, we have information uh, not only at administrative level data, but a very disaggregated economic data, most of the times at the functional level and even at the geographical level, so that all, you know, data manipulations can take place in order to uh, answer a variety of, of uh, expansion analysis questions. And finally, one of the key features of the boost is the reliability, which basically what it means is that w when we post this information, it has already gone through a, um, a vetting process uh, whereby we process this information and we reconcile against available published figures, whether it's a budget document or whether it's an execution report. We also uh, use IMF tables and other reports to sort of come to a, 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 a conclusion that this data is reliable to the, you know, to the best extent possible. Uh, it's also interesting for us to highlight that this might not always be possible because sometimes there are inherent uh, uh, issues on the PFM system that might not make that possible. Uh, and what we've done in those cases is that we have documented whatever has not been possible to, to, to fully reconcile so that the user is aware of any limitations of data. And in fact, that can also be taken by in-country reformers to sort of engage on a, 
on a multi-stakeholder dialogue around the reliability of, reliability of fiscal data, the same way the for instance in Togo are starting to take hold, and that's uh, something that we want to see more often. Um, if we move now to the what section, so, so what, what exactly is being disseminated in the portal? And of course, you, you probably received a link and you might already surface uh, uh, the website, but there are basically three major pillars. The most important one is obviously we, we're giving access to data, but we're also providing documentation and we're providing... The a conference recording has failed. Okay. <laughs> I don't have to start again, right? <laughs> And, and resources. So let's focus for once at, on the access to data. Um, and, and, and here we're going to have a, a series of, of, of videos in the background that you, can, that you can follow while I actually describe it. So one way that we're using is we're using the bank Socrata platform, which is really the, the infrastructure that the bank uses for its own open data. I think one of the useful features about the Socrata platform is that it allows us to handle very large data sets. The ones you see right now here featured is Peru, which has several million uh, uh, rows of, of data, which would have been impossible for us to share in, in any other fashion except here. So users will be able to quickly manipulate data and will be able to produce charts, and in this case, uh, you know, follow the evolution of economic spending over 10 years or so. So this is something that is provided for any users to play around with. It will require a little bit of familiarity with the platform but there are tutorials in the Socrata platform that can really help the users uh, through this experience. Of course, one thing that we do for every country is that we also provide the, the Excel interface. That's really what has always been one of the appealing features of the Boost work, which is that we provide this in the most simplest, in the simplest way so that users can really uh, manipulate data using the typical pivot uh, functionalities to which most people are familiar with. We're looking here at the case of Kenya. Once again, we have over 10 years of data for Kenya, and we're looking at examples of how we can monitor how uh, allocation and spending has occurred in uh, by administration or by function, but also creating more uh, granular searches that is looking at within functions of what has been the economic breakdown and so forth. This can be done for every country that is currently uh, uh, featuring the portal. And, and, and a third feature that we have introduced, which is something that we build in-house, are these web-based interfaces. This is basically, is a, uh, it replicates the same functionality that an Excel uh, uh, spreadsheet would do, but it, it basically spares the users from having to download sometimes uh, uh, very large documents. And instead, if a user is interested in a particular query, what it can do is simply replicate that query in, uh, uh, through these pivot, pivot inter, uh, interfaces, which will generate an output which can then be downloaded in, uh, in Excel or on any other matters. So this is something that every country also has uh, built in uh, as part of the resources that we're making available. The second feature is documentation, and here I'm just going to talk about the user manual. So every country has a user manual. The, way, the reason why we build this initially is because internally we want to make sure that if a new team uh, gets handed over the responsibility of building a boost, everything will be documented here, how it was built, what were the sources of data, what were some of the challenges that were faced, so that a new team could immediately take over and, and continue the exercise. But we find that this could be a useful exercise also for any kind of users, because the information that is here not only tells us how it was built, but it also flags what are some of the peculiarities of the database. It flags whether there are some ascending issues that need to be resolved, which is important for the user to know. It gives some examples about uh, some potential applications of the tool. So it really gives a snapshot uh, for, for the user to be fully familiar with what he's looking at without spending an, an enormous amount of time in, ter in terms of getting uh, familiarized with the database. First, in terms of resources, and I'm going to have this video run uh, in the backwards, we provide two sets of resources. One resource is more global, and it's sort of giving up a, an overview of sectoral uh, techniques of public expansion reviews produced by the bank, in particular highlighting the ones where the Boost platform was used to sort of show what has been some of the, the, the innovative expansion analysis that has been, been made possible by the, um, uh, by the Boost platform and so forth. But we also have a set of resources that are country specific, like the ones that you're looking at it right now for Kenya, which is basically there's three sections. There is a section that sort of summarizes what are some of the most important documents being published. And that includes normally whether there is a ROSC, whether there is a PIF assessment, uh, whether there is MTF interfaces, uh, IMF tables, uh, and, uh, and so forth. A second tab, which I think you saw through the videos, is, is try to, tries to map the work of civil society organizations so that we have a clear view of what they're doing and, and what they're working on. And 
ideally we want to monitor the specific use that these organizations are making of this data so that we can document the progressive uh, increase uh, in the data and in the use of this data. Uh, and finally, and here we have another video, we also provide some snapshots. We know that some people are afraid of numbers, and maybe instead of going straight to the numbers, uh, they can actually uh, look at uh, some of these visualizations that are created. Unfortunately, I don't see the video uh, moving forward, but uh, what, what this visualization provides is a sort of a snapshot of what are normally typical PR tables that are just visualized on the basis of the data that is being stored in the Socrata platforms, so users will be able to to get a very quick snapshot of some of these uh, uh, key relationships without having to go through all the hassles of, 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 of working with the data. And finally, on my last session, on my last uh, uh, section of the presentation, let's let me provide you a few country examples. Uh, two countries are actually not featured in this map because we couldn't get them there. These are Solomon Islands and Kiribati, and I wanted to make sure to say that these countries as well are, are being part of the launch so they don't feel left out. We just couldn't get them uh, in the map. But I'd like to provide four examples of, applica of either applic actual applications that we've done with the tool or potential applications. Uh, let's start first with the case of Moldova, which was mentioned be before. Uh, we have uh, speakers uh, that have joining us from there, and I think it's, uh, it, it makes all the sense of the world. Uh, in Moldova, the Boost platform uh, it was one of the most granular that was built. And, and as I said before, the, most, the more granular a platform is, the more is, uh, we can elevate the quality of expenditure analysis. So in the case of uh, Moldova, and you can see this quick video, uh, the Boost platform contained data for school level data. And at a very granular economic and some functional disaggregation, um, and I can't really, I think it's still loading, but um, uh, basically, what, what we had and what we were able to do in Moldova, which eventually informed the school optimization program, is to show that per, that per pupil finance, per pupil expenditures were skyrocketing as a result of expenditures still being too high and the pupil population decreasing. By having access to the granular data, where we were able to show for specific economic items, in this case, uh, uh, electricity expenditures on a per pupil basis, we were able to really get the Ministry of Finance and the Ministry of Education. To, to talk about uh, you know, the unsustainable financing, which led to the school optimization program, which is underway and has already produced a lot of efficiency gains, which we would expect to generate higher quality standards uh, moving forward. So having access to this data was actually very uh, um, critical in, in ensuring this, and we have to credit Dino Marotto and his PR team for making this happen. Um, Going a step further, and this has been one of the first uh, graphics that have been produced, in fact, probably even predates the Boost initiative, is to sort of look in at how do we cross information drawn from the Boost platform, which is financing financial data with non-financial indicators, and how do we get them together to enhance the understanding of, of relationship between spending and outputs. So what you see in this graph, for instance, in the case of Poland, one of the countries being disseminated here, is that we have combined finance uh, per pupil expenditures, which is symbolized by the size of the bubbles, with some socioeconomic indicators, um, literacy rates, which is disseminated, which is shown on the uh, x-axis, with test scores disseminated on the y-axis, and, uh, and other demographics, uh, demographic information basically distinguishing between rural municipalities and urban municipalities. What that allows us to do is to really get into a, 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 um, an argument around of relative efficiencies because we are able to really compare apples with apples. You know, comparing Tarlo with Ruta Tartak is a very compelling comparison because these are two municipalities. Both of them are uh, rural municipalities. They have very similar uh, adult literacy rates, which normally is a good predictor of child behavior in schools. And yet we see that one municipality was performing much better than the other one, despite spending much less. So this was a way for us to engage with the Ministry of Education, the Ministry of Finance, to sort of start getting a dialogue around why different combinations of spending produce different, uh, uh, different outputs and so forth. So this has been one of the signature analysis that has been facilitated by uh, the Boost platform. A third one, and I think I mentioned that briefly, you know, revenue side has often been neglected in public expansion reviews on, 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 and, and, and in many other ways, but they offer a very compelling case to be included as well. And uh, I'm happy to say that in, in, in almost half 
the countries that are currently featuring the portal, we also collect the revenue data. And here you see a few examples of why that would be relevant. For instance, we can look at, user, at, the, at the trends of user fees within the ministries and compare that with the expenditure data. We can ask the questions, are user fees, is the growth in user fee uh, consistent with the, with the growth of, on, on expenditures? Or, or if not, does that mean that uh, there is a growing deficit or something that has to be addressed? This is analysis that was performed, for instance, in Seychelles uh, uh, and in Kenya. But of course, there could be other applications. In, in Kiribati, the boost was used by Tobias Hack, one of our colleagues, uh, to inform a medium-term fiscal projection model uh, and, uh, and also to inform about what particular features of in, in the tax policies could be addressed by, by having a, a revenue boost platform that will really allow and to pinpoint which dimensions should be focused on. And finally, Rio Grande, and this is going to be my uh, last example. Uh, this is uh, it's relevant because for the most part, this data might be appealing to global organizations and national think tanks, but there is some data that can actually appeal to grassroots organizations as well. For instance, we're all familiar with, with participatory budgeting experience in, in, uh, in, Rio, in Rio Grande, being this the largest in the world, with, uh, uh, I believe, 1.2 million people, that is 20% of adult, adult uh, uh, population participating every year in voting on capital spending allocated for uh, specific municipalities. And, uh, and the boost platform for, for Rio Grande contains very detailed data at the project level data uh, uh, for each one of these participatory budgeting mechanisms. One of the long last long standing um, uh, demands from civil society in Rio Grande has always been how do we monitor the executions of these of this things, the things that we're voting on that they're actually being executed. We don't really don't have access to data. This platform will give access to the data and will act and, uh, among other things. So we see that this can, can both appeal to national think tanks but also in some cases where the data is granular enough also to grassroots organizations. And so I just uh, I uh, want to conclude by just thanking everyone, and I hope that that despite the hurried up presentations, you got a sense of the you know the untapped potentials on which we're sitting, and we are hoping that moving forward collectively we can we can sort of uh, see how we can leverage this data uh, in order to encourage public participations. And I'm very happy to see in the next session to hear from Kampala, from Chisinau, and from London about a fresh new perspectives on how that can uh, happen. Thank you. Thank you, Massimo. Uh, uh, you really uh, managed to give us a sense of the richness uh, that, that this portal provides. And uh, but unfortunately, we are quickly running out of time. So I just want to go and uh, and hear from our colleagues. Uh, and we'll start with uh, Chisinau. Um, I believe they are well connected, and I think it's Abdullah Sek, the World Bank Country Manager, who's going to go first. So Abdullah, please. Uh, th thank you, uh, Robert, and uh, uh, good morning, uh, colleague uh, in D.C., and good morning to my old friend, Nicholas, uh, sitting uh, uh, beside you. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, good afternoon to colleague uh, in uh, London and Kampala. Uh, uh, we are very happy to be here uh, today, and uh, I think, uh, Victor, my colleague, uh, will uh, uh, really uh, be... Uh, you'll agree with me that uh, this floor today uh, belongs to... Uh, Irina uh, Tisakota, who is a coordinator for the Open Government Initiative in uh, the Government of Moldova, and uh, to Victoria uh, Vlad, who is an economist at Expert Group, and Expert Group, group is one of the uh, lead think tank uh, here in, in, the, in Moldova. Uh, certainly, I, I would like uh, also to, uh, to join Massimo to thank, I think, two persons who had played a key role in uh, uh, launching a boost in Moldova, and one uh, Massimo Mansion is uh, Dino uh, uh, Meruto, uh, who used to be our senior country economist here, now lead economist at the anchor there. And uh, the other one is the former Minister of Finance, uh, Vasily Negu uh, Veseslav Negutsa. I think uh, they have done a good uh, uh, deal here in, Mol in Moldova, pushing for this very important initiative. So today, uh, uh, Irina and Victoria will have a chance to tell us about uh, many important, uh, I think, initiatives taking place in Moldova. I mean, from open government, open data, and uh, a variety, actually, of, uh, of instruments, including boosts uh, that, that are helping to strengthen uh, social accountability and uh, certainly help to improve uh, service delivery uh, in this country. And uh, the World Bank has been very supportive to all those initiatives, I mean, uh, both at the uh, strategic level, but also at uh, the uh, more operational level. 
Uh, when one uh, look at the strategic level, I mean, we look at our partnership strategy with uh, Moldova. A big part of it is on uh, ac governance and, uh, and social accountability. We see it as a very effective way to improve indeed service delivery uh, and have an impact, uh, uh, a good impact uh, for the for the citizen in this country. Uh, at the operational level. Uh, we approved, for instance, in 2011, a credit, uh, IDA credit of about 20 million US dollars to support uh, the whole agenda of how we can use ICT to transform the way public services are delivered uh, to the citizens. Uh, and uh, when it, it comes to, for instance, uh, now the knowledge agenda, we have uh, work uh, with uh, our counterpart, with civil society groups here uh, to launch boost. And we have uh, delivered uh, and continue to deliver a series of uh, training programs, I mean, uh, for uh, government counterpart, but also from, for uh, civil society uh, groups uh, in, in the country. And uh, Massimo was making that point. Uh, Boost has helped us a lot in terms of our operation. Uh, Massimo, did, he did mention, for instance, how uh, Boost has informed uh, the preparation of uh, the ongoing education reform program in, uh, in Moldova. It's a very, uh, I would say, uh, sensitive uh, agenda in a context where you have a, a declining population and an oversized uh, school infrastructure. So that was important uh, for Boost to frame the debate in a way that has been very helpful to push uh, the reform uh, uh, ahead. And that was to show that uh, with uh, increased efficiency, one can help uh, improve the quality of, uh, of uh, education in this country. And clearly that is a part where Moldova was lagging a lot behind some of its neighbors in EU and OECD countries overall. Uh, and the same thing is happening in the health sector. We are working uh, very closely uh, with the uh, Minister of Health, with the uh, uh, civil society group involved in the health sector. Actually, I should say these are two sectors for which uh, we have uh, uh, either applied or benefited from uh, support from the uh, Global Partnership for Social Accountability, and that is again another way to use a uh, boost and other instrument to make sure that uh, we can have this uh, feedback loop from uh, users, consumers, citizens uh, to government so they can indeed improve the way they deliver services. Now, that said, I, I was uh, listening to Massimo, we heard uh, a lot of uh, feedback, a good example of what is happening right now with, with the data. And uh, I would like to stress maybe that is still the challenge because, uh, yes, one could look at uh, the initiatives and say they are very young initiatives. I mean, when uh, uh, really government of Moldova, for instance, uh, uh, initiated uh, uh, the open government uh, uh, agenda in April of 2012, I believe, in, uh, in, uh, in Brazil, isn't it? Yes, yeah. And uh, so it is relatively young. So maybe we should have... Uh, realistic expectation when what we could expect uh, indeed from uh, uh, their direct impact uh, on service delivery, maybe we should be patient. But still, I think where I am sitting here uh, in Moldova, and uh, I really do care a lot, I do see that uh, poverty still is relatively significant. I do see that uh, uh, service delivery is, is very often poor, especially for the less privileged. And so I would have loved to see a much more result, maybe faster result. And any ways, for instance, uh, of a good practice, emerging good exam practice in other countries whereby this uh, open data, this uh, increased transparency is fueling uh, uh, faster reforms, I think will be very much appreciated, something we would like certainly to, to, uh, to listen to and capture and so to uh, uh, add uh, uh, to our ongoing efforts here. And certainly, uh, uh, Irina and uh, Anna Victoria could tell us a lot more about uh, what they are doing. Because I, again, I mentioned earlier, they are the the, the one to who to whom this uh, fraud belongs really. So, Irina, <laughs> Victoria, please. Um, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Irina Tisakova, and I'm the Open Government and Open Data Coordinator at the. Uh, Moldova Government Center, and I'll give you a brief overview uh, about the launch of Boost Initiative in Moldova and uh, some of the main challenges that we're facing in regards to using that data. 
Um, we launched the Open uh, Government Data Initiative in April 2011 with the launch of the Open Data Portal. And uh, this initiative was part of the larger uh, Governance e-Transformation Initiative uh, agenda uh, launched in 2010. And one month after the portal was released, uh, the Ministry of Finance um, issued, launched uh, the Boost. Uh, the Ministry of Finance worked hard uh, together with the World Bank uh, since it was a World Bank project and we received a lot, a lot of support from the World Bank. And we were actually the first country to release um, a Boost uh, database, a comprehensive database on uh, uh, public expenditure in uh, in uh, Moldova. And uh, through this uh, uh, release, the Ministry of Finance became the champion of uh, open data in Moldova, and it um, uh, motivated other, uh, put pressure on other public institutions uh, to release data. And uh, right now, uh, through collaboration uh, uh, with the Ministry of Finance, uh, we did not uh, only ensure that the boost is uh, updated yearly, but also the Ministry of Finance uh, publishes monthly data on uh, uh, public expenditure and also planned and executed budget which is very detailed information. And also, we do not only have it um, yearly as data, but also monthly. So it provides a lot of uh, content for, uh, for civil society, for private sector, for experts to, uh, to analyze. Uh, also, the importance of um, open, in, open, uh, uh, open budgets is um, highlighted by strong demand from civil society during the open government action plan elaboration consultation process. But despite the fact that we have uh, quite high transparency uh, for the budget and also high demand for, uh, for, for this data, um, the consumption of the data is not that high. So the transparency is just one part. It is a very important move. But what we need right now, and we are at the stage where we actually need to, uh, to stimulate the consumption of the data, because only by stimulating uh, the, the consumption and reuse of uh, this public sector information, we can actually draw the value of um, the data that is um, uh, already made public. And uh, I would like to highlight one important thing is that we, uh, despite low demand for such data, we have uh, some uh, wonderful examples of reuse of this information. We have uh, budget stories that my colleague Victoria will present. It is a think tank that reuses uh, uh, budget expenditure data to, uh, to visualize it and create stories for citizens to understand the data uh, behind that sophisticated boost database that not everybody has the skills to, to analyze. And in addition uh, to these efforts, the government of Moldova is working hard to advance the overall open data um, agenda. Uh, we will soon release the new version of the open data portal, uh, hopefully by the end of uh, next month. Also, we released, uh, uh, the parliament approved the new law on public sector information reuse. And right now, ministries are implementing it in order to release even more indicators, not only financial, but from other fields, so that um, anybody, uh, citizens, uh, experts, analysts, uh, civil society, private sector, could use those other indicators and couple them with the Boost database to create very interesting findings, also uh, helpful for, for policymakers. And hopefully that could, in the end, um, result in uh, poverty elevation and also highlighting some of the uh, corruption um, um, cases that we, we still face. So uh, what we're doing is we uh, try to, to highlight the most important uh, open data initiatives and uh, um, raise awareness around the data that is already there. We try to establish a closer collaboration with civil society to know what uh, demand is out there and for which specific data. And as uh, Nathaniel uh, mentioned earlier, is we really need to develop capacity of those intermediaries and intermediaries 
to ensure that uh, we get the most value out of data that is out there. And now I'll let Victoria talk about the wonderful uh, example of reuse of uh, budget data, uh, the budget stories .md. Thank you, Irina. Just to connect the presentation really shortly. First, I should uh, also say congratulations uh, for the launch of the uh, Open Budgets portal. I really hope that there's going to be a lot of demand and uses of those data. And I would like to present shortly on a real concrete example of how we have used Boost data to create something for the citizens and to improve the flow of information from government to citizens. Uh, we And I should also say at the beginning that this initiative, Budget Stories, Building a Citizen's Budget Understanding, was launched uh, as a result of a workshop on, um, on working with Boost Data back in May of the World Bank Institute. Uh, so we have launched budgetstories.md in February, so we are pretty young in this project. Um, Expert Group uses I should say Expert Group is a think tank here in Chisinau. It is specialized in economic and policy research. And of course, we work with a lot of data, whether it being for analytical reports or um, economic forecasts. However, with budgetstories.md, we've tried a different approach, namely data visualization. So we've launched in February with the support of Soros um, Foundation Moldova and Open Society Foundations. And in this project, we are the analysts at the expert group, but we also made a partnership with uh, RT Design Studio. They are project partners who help us design our analysis. And we've done all of this with a with a purpose to to inform the society on how the public budget is created and to and also on the ways that the public money are being spent. Definitely by doing that in a visual and descri uh, descriptive and accessible form. And we are analyzing multiple sets of data, including the Boost Data tool, which has, has been really helpful in our work. We were using it before. However, in the in the budget stores at MD, we um, scaled it up the use of this data, and we've looked it even closer at different se uh, spending sectors. So, as I said, we're using different data sources, uh, open data sources, including from the Ministry of Finance and Ministry of Education, and we make requests for data. Uh, on an active basis. We then work with our IT and design partners to create this data stories. Uh, there's a lot of uh, back and forth feedback and we're trying to, co to maintain communication with our key stakeholders in the project so the analysis tackle the most relevant uh, questions from the spending sectors and we're using a series of tool, tools to create a community around uh, the, the budget issues and to, to create a, a space where, where people can participate and contribute and um, we want this to be not only one way dialogue but are both uh, a double way dialogue. Well, that is a dialogue, definitely. Uh, so what can you find on Budget Stories? A series of infographics, and just to really go shortly over some of those, uh, some, some of the most interesting examples, at least for me, uh, is the, one of the infographics in education, higher education, where we've seen by using um, not only Boost data, but also Ministry of Education data, and uh, the data from the National Bureau of Statistics, we've seen that out of all the students in the higher education in Moldova, 54%, uh, over 54%, were studying in five universities. So you can see the concentration here. But also, these universities spend most of the money. So 56.9% um, of all the money uh, in, for uh, allocated for higher education. And we've also tried to answer questions such as what the educational level spends most of the public money and uh, how did the average number of students change for each, uh, for each educational level. And you can see that um, for, for three out of four educational levels, um, if you look at the data for a whole decade, you can see that for three out of four, the number, average number of students has gone down dramatically. And we, we wanted to ring the bell about this and uh, put it out there, represent it, so 
it is it is something that becomes say um, something often in the dialogue about the um, the efficiency of spending and the the demographic issues and so forth. Of course, we've, uh, it, is, it is not easy. It is, uh, we, we, we are meeting with a lot of difficulties. First of all, the access. We would need more data from the local level. Uh, of course, in, in Boosted is a disaggregated level, but we, we would like more data produced at the local level, uh, that including non-financial indicators. We need data which is openly licensed because most of the times it holds the copyright of the ministry that produces the data. And also we would need more machine readable data. Uh, what else can you find about on budgetstories.md? Uh, we try to put in a single image the whole uh, budget calendar of, uh, of the country and we've displayed, uh, by visiting the website you could, you could see that we've displayed uh, the uh, f five stages of the budget process. We've uh, put over there all the documents that are being produced uh, in the budget process and whether or not they're published in a timely manner for citizens to, cons to consult. Also on budget stories you can you could find um, different uh, visualizations uh, using the open spending visual uh, visualizing tools. Uh, we've looked at how money is going to be it's planned to be spent in 2014. Also, we have licensed everything openly with a Creative Commons, the most simple license, the 3.0 Creative Commons license. Um, also, we've tried to remove a barrier by giving access to the clean data that we've worked with and the infographic materials in editable forms. So whoever is interested, any interested stakeholders can take the data, work it again and make their own infographics and their, uh, their deeper analysis so they can continue the discussions. Um, and also it is easy, really easy to become a project partner. Any um, media network which is interested can, can become a project partner by a few clicks on the website. So by now it's, it's maybe early to talk about results, but some, something that um, is intermediary. We've built this website by the stories at MD. We've created a couple of interactive modules, 14 infographics by now. 10 national informational partners, over 120 news items on the new content published on the website. And we're proud to say we've built a community around this. So this might seem uh, small for the, for the international um, media maybe, but for, for Moldova, this, these are pretty good results for the beginning. So there's still a, a lot of work to do, but we're proud um, for the work done just by now. Um, I'd like to, to thank you, to invite you to check out Budget Stories on the website and on the social media outlets. Uh, check out the new content. Uh, it is unfortunately only in Romanian, but we promise to, uh, to, uh, to think about putting it in different languages as well. So interact with data and we're, we're there for, for questions. Uh, at the same time, we, we plan to use Body Stories as a tool to visualize the, um, the analysis of the expert group and to advocate for a more efficient spending of the, of the public money. So again, thanks so much. And uh, for any question, uh, to just tweet me or find me at contact at bystories.md. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Abdullahi, um, Irina, and Victoria, um, both providing us with um, uh, some uh, detailed um, under, uh, understanding of the both the disclosure issues um, and, and the power, I think, of, of combining financial and non-financial information, um, and and on and on the um, challenges and the um, opportunities around building effective use. Um, uh, so great promise, um, but uh, with a lot to do, as you've said. So thank you very much for that. Um, we'd now like to turn over to Kampala um, and, and to invite um, uh, Laban Mbula Mukul, who is the Commissioner for Budget Policy and Evaluation Department in the Ministry of Finance. Thank you so much for, for, our, for our friends in, in Kampala for waiting. It's quite late there, I think, now in the evening. Um, we look forward to hearing uh, your reactions to the, to the discussion so far. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening to London and uh, Moldova, and probably good morning to Washington. Are you hearing me? Yes, we are. Thank you. Yeah. 
So I will start by thanking the Nicola, Nathanael, and the Massimo from the bank for the background information they have given us on the Budget Transparency Initiative and the experiences that our colleagues in Moldova have gone through to promote budget transparency. On our side in Kampala, I would start by saying that we had a long history of budget transparency, I think since around 1997, when we introduced universal primary education, we required schools to publish capitation grants on the notice boards. We also required the local government to display the budgets on their public notice boards. Then as Minister of Finance, we've been publishing budget documents as well as budget allocation in the newspapers. We do what we call a budget pullout at every time we present the budget. And then we also developed what we call a citizen's guide to the budget process. And then as we move along, we have uh, brought the media on, on board. We have trained the media. We now do press conferences on budget releases on a quarterly basis and also publish the budget releases in the print media. And then to follow up on the utilization of resources, the Office of the Prime Minister uses a system called the Baraza Initiative. This is where the local government leaders are put to task, or government officials are put to task to explain what they did with the money that was given to them. But we realize that uh, we need to be more organized, systematic, and uh, we developed a budget transparency strategy with the support of ODI BSI in 2012. And this initiative has grown out of partnerships and forms part of this strategy. We are partnering with the, ourselves as Minister of Finance, we also working in the civil society organizations accord and the civil society organization on the budget, as well as BSI, ODI, and IPF, or University of Yale. On our part as Minister of Finance, we are committed ourselves to deliver budget, information, budget and performance information on time, or timely information. And this information is disseminated via the website we have through this initiative, we have developed a budget website where we post all this information. But to get down to the communities or the cities that demand for services for the money that have been provided, we're also going to use online or we are using online budget tools and the mobile phones. And then we also, through the, the CSOs, the civil society organizations, intermediaries have been identified and capacity is being built for these people to be able to interpret the budget information and also facilitate the feedback from the citizenry on, the, on what has been done. And then we get the feedback. We launched our budget website in uh, July this year. And so far we are doing very well. The, budgets, the website has two, we call them two platforms. One is specifically for the local governments, where we'll find information on what has been planned, what has been delivered, what resources have been released to the local governments to deliver these services by sub-county and the parish. These are the small administrative units. So you are able to trace that a service like education, if it is construction of schools, they are being constructed in a particular location, a particular district, a particular sub-county, and a particular village. So you are able to give feedback. And this one builds very well on the Baraza initiative, because if money is provided for for, cons for particular service and you does it, it's not done, the citizen is able to get back to the Baraza and say, yes, you send the money, but the school they are talking about is not available. Or the health center they are talking about is not available. The road they are talking about is not available. Or was shortly done. But that does not go without challenges. One of the challenges definitely is you do, with the time you've been having, for instance, substitution between government and the civil society. So now we, we need to make sure that the, the initiative that we have taken on with the civil society, we maintain that mutual trust. Because we are working on mutual trust. 
what is key is that the information that is put on the made available should be properly analyzed, interpreted, and given to the, the, the citizenry in a way that is able to, for them, they are able to comprehend and make use of that information. So we need to maintain that trust. Again, on our side as government, we have challenges of uh, what you would call budget credibility. But in most cases, the budget is not implemented as appropriated by parliament because of budget cuts or revenue, you know, call them revenue challenges. And then on the ground, we find that uh, accounting officers do misreporting. You give them money to do something else and they spend money on something else. The lucky stay in enforcing the public budgetary and financial control procedures, like mischarge of expenditure, misappropriation and diversion of funds. As I said earlier, we are not able to implement the budget as the passed by parliament because of supplementary funding and therefore the accumulation of arrears. Our payroll is still bloated with ghost staff. We are paying for people who are not there. And I would just want to say that uh, we are resolved to promote or improve budget transparency as the key for service delivery. Because this is the only way we shall be able to see inputs and outputs transforming into better outcomes. And then we also determined to encourage our strong partnership with the civil society and development partners. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I, I must appreciate the, the frankness with which you shared with us the ongoing challenges of, of effective budget uh, management, um, 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 but also pointing us to some of the um, benefits and opportunities around accountability um, that um, that uh, that that, you, that uh, Uganda has been um, um, using information to to enable, particularly at the local government level, um, but also as uh, you know, in a sense, the budget tra budget transparency as as a, one of the tools and one of the opportunities for um, enabling uh, strengthening budget management in general in in Uganda and elsewhere. But thank you very much. Um, and now. Um, Turning uh, to London, and I think it will be Simon Gill of the Deputy Director of the Budget Strengthening Initiative at, uh, at ODI, um, who will be leading off for London. Good afternoon, Simon. Hi, good afternoon from London, and um, good afternoon to Moldova and Kampala. Good evening to Kampala, and good morning, Washington, and to anyone else, wherever you are online. Um, it's a fantastic achievement to see the Boost Initiative launched on the portal and it's great to be at this end and particularly to follow on from Uganda and also from Moldova to hear what you've been doing there. Very interesting. I've just got, I'm conscious of time, I've got four quick points, four challenges and, and maybe one opportunity that we can maybe have time to pursue as a, as a group, a community of people interested in transparency. In terms of challenges, I think one of the things that the Boost and the open budget portal is really good, is this challenge of comparability, having data which is comparable both over country, over time, um, over space. I think one of the things that the boost data has is, is been really helpful to help us address that challenge. I think there's a challenge of disaggregation. I mean, Massimo made the point that granular information is much better. I think one of the challenges facing all of us is how we get good quality granular information. We've got Rebecca Simpson in the room here in London who's co-wrote a paper with Paolo Dorenzio on um, transparency for what and one of the points I think they emphasise is how difficult it is to get good quality disaggregated information despite the fact that there's a lot of information out there. There's a challenge of illustration, Nathaniel made that point, you know how do we present data and how do we make use of it? I think there's some good examples from both Uganda and Moldova, how, how information is being used, but I think the challenge for all of us is to see that the information is being used. I understand actually in Uganda, I think Nicola, you made the point about different parts of government using information, and I understand that the Inspector General is using information that's on the budget website in Uganda when they go and do their site visits. Um, but I think we've got to be able to demonstrate as a community that information is being used. And Nicola, I think the diagram that you put up which showed um, transparency leading through participation through to accountability, I think budget transparency is very necessary for all of that, 
but it's not sufficient um, to demonstrate improved accountability. I mean, one of the interests here in London, well, particularly from ODI and maybe from other people around the room here and maybe in Washington as well, is how do we grow the research base in this area? How do we develop evidence? How do we demonstrate the theories of change which shows that better transparency leads to better participation and through to accountability. I thought the stories, the stories that were emanating from Moldova were really interesting and I think we need more stories showing how information is used. Um, I think we in, in, in ODI have a challenge to help users make more effective use of the data. I think we've gone a long way in getting the data out there but how do we in ODI and how do others around the room um, help people to make better use of the information? I like the example that Massimo made of showing apples of showing comparing apples with apples and I think the final thing I, I want to say is I don't underestimate the time that's been put into a very complex area but sometimes some of the things that make a real difference are relatively simple one of the things that we did in London a few months ago was we convened a discussion with civil society in London NGOs who are particularly interested in advocacy on the budget process and we linked them up actually with colleagues in Uganda who um, illustrated some of the points and some of the, the facets of the Uganda budget. And one of the pow most powerful messages that came through for that discussion was that civil society didn't really fully understand that there is a budget cycle and there's a time at which the information can be gleaned and points can be fed in, but there's also a time when actually making points doesn't make a difference. So I, I sort of welcome what the colleague said from Moldova about getting actually the budget cycle up on the website because I think sometimes very simple things can make a difference. So I welcome all the information that's now available online. I think it's great for research institutes like ODI. There's a huge amount of stuff we can mine but I think we also need to think carefully about how we make data accessible and useful and how do we help people explain and understand. So that's all from me. Thanks. Simon, thank you very much, and thank you for your sort of um, insightful uh, and concise um, the set of comments, most helpful. Um, we have, I think, only one, round of one uh, time for one round of questions. So oh, what I would, and comments and on, on observations, what I, if I may <laughs> suggest is um, we're slightly oddly configured here, so unfortunately I'll call it our, the screens are behind us. Um, so if you see me doing that, that's what I'm looking back to, to see you um, in London and Kampala and... Uh, uh, in Moldova. So um, can I suggest if you have points you would like to raise from there, can you just shout out because I'm, I'm afraid we're not going to see. Um, so please feel free to shout, to shout out. Maybe I can ask our colleagues who are not in the room, first of all, if you have any uh, comments or questions you would like to make. If not, I can hold and ask for some in the room and we'll come back to you. But don't let me forget you and shout, please. So if, can I invite um, our colleagues here in Washington who have been very, uh, very patient with us and very uh, uh, carefully listening, and I'm sure. So can I invite others to, and perhaps if you would come up, Mary, great, please do come up to the microphone so everyone will be able to hear you. And then Manoa, great, thank you. Hello? Yeah, there we go. It's on? Okay. Uh, first, congratulations to the team. It's really impressive, all the work. I have three really quick questions. Um, there was some mention of users, and my question is if you have a systematic way of monitoring who the users are and capturing that information to feed it back into further design issues. The second question is who pays for this? Uh, it seems like it's something that governments would like to have. Are they willing to pay for it? Um, and the third question is, how are you interfacing now with operations on this? Because it strikes me as something that our operational colleagues would be very keen to bring into their work. So maybe a little bit of discussion about that. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Munawar Khwaja, lead specialist, uh, tax, and rev uh, tax policy and revenue administration. Uh, uh, Massimo, I was very glad that Massimo mentioned that the portal, uh, the Open Budgets portal, is also looking at some revenue data. And that's a very important opportunity for increasing transparency because not only do you have the budget side, but also you see 
uh, from the where your tax dollar is going for that from that perspective it, it provides a better opportunity for people uh, to be more to be more uh, tolerant if I can say use the word about paying their taxes uh, because no one wants to pay taxes uh, as, as a first on the first instance unless you know where the so if you link the revenues to the budget uh, expenditure that, that that's a very good thing and in this respect uh, I was I would like to point out a product that uh, we have come out with it is called tax at a glance this is uh, currently just for for Europe and Central Asia countries about 30 countries and maybe if we can we can use that in the portal and it has got data on 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 the different tax rates on on the structure of the revenue from different uh, sources on budget uh, deficits uh, and and also the size of administration the efficiency of different revenues in terms of uh, productivity so all this if if we if we can collaborate with you on on uh, using revenue data also uh, and slowly grow the the pie to a larger uh, pool of countries then you you'd have a real complete uh, budget uh, information available to citizens thank you i think i think we have one from london i think I go ahead um, yeah, so one quick comment and a question. So the comment is um, just to echo what uh, Simon said in terms of the importance of comparability of data, partly because it helps you to be able to you know, compare between um, different uh, resource flows, so to be able to compare both, for example, budget data, maybe aid, extractives, and other sorts of resource flows, and also because you get economies of scale in developing applications and that kind of thing, so that you can then hopefully get some more of the, the um, intermediaries <coughs> using this data down the chain. Um, and also, you, you can get kind of more, more data out kind of beyond the boost process as well, I think, maybe. And so I think looking at standards in this respect, while, while it's you know, slightly um, tedious, perhaps, I think is also very important. And so the, the question, though, is um, in terms of sustainability. So when, when boost leaves and, and when you know, the, the, the boost process kind of moves on, um, how sustainable is the release of the data? So it sounds like in Moldova and Uganda, that's, that's definitely the case, it sounds like. Um, and, I, and I know that there are these the documents that, um, that I think Massimo uh, referred to as well in terms of how you put together the data. But generally, how, how, how kind of common will it be that that the data will continue to flow, especially if there's a lot of kind of manual work that needs to be done to go around collecting data from different places. Okay. Uh, thank you. I will probably not answer in the same order, but uh, in the order that might make sense. Um, you know, all the points that, uh, that, and I'm sorry I won't be facing you because the microphone is this way, but uh, maybe you'll be seeing me. Um, you know, on all the questions that uh, the, the Simon raised, I think we're going to have a dedicated session coming up now, so I don't have to answer them all uh, right now. But I, I think what the purpose you referred to, transparency for what that Paolo and Rebecca have written, uh, I was reading it and, and I was really saying this is exactly the kind of challenges that we have set up to address through this portal. And it would be nice to have a conversation about whether you feel that the data that is being disseminated is exactly what, what you know, addresses exactly the kind of challenges that, that, you, were, that you were flagging. Um, on, on Mary's uh, three questions, first, who pays? Uh, well, so far, uh, we, the bank, uh, has paid for most of it. And, and I think it was the right thing to do because we were still on a demonstration mode. We didn't have enough critical mass. But we already seen that a lot of countries have actually asked us to, to, to be trained to maintain that themselves. So to us, that basically means that, that they will be paying moving forward because they will be doing the exercise. And for us, that's the best outcome that we could have envisioned because that answers also the sustainability question. If we can get more and more countries to really see the value of doing this and do it themselves with only minimal interventions on our side, that will save our time and will really create more local ownership. And it seems to be that in some countries that, that, that's, that is the direction that is going. Uh, on the, on, on the on monitoring users, uh, 
I don't think we have yet a proper M&E on, on, on in place, but clearly the portal will be the place where we're going to be monitoring that information. So the budget stories, for instance, is featured there. It's more still on an anecdotal basis, so knowing about this, uh, whether we can move on a more systematic basis, I think that also becomes something that operations can can help us as well, and that addresses your, your two point as well. And al although in that case, I also like to add that in some countries, you know, the, the link with operation has been very clear because uh, the work on, on boost is based on, around uh, public expenditure reviews, it's based about DPLs. So uh, in virtually every country, that operations has always been our entry point. And in many cases, these things going public has been the, to the credit of our operation colleagues making this happen and not necessarily just us uh, um, uh, doing this. And then maybe I'll just conclude by, by addressing what, what Simon was saying before, which is very important. We can release the data and we can uh, even train on how to use the data, but, but the PFM side cannot be overlooked. If you don't know at which point of the budget cycle you want to intervene, that's not going to be a, a cell phone, which is why our focus has always been, as in the case of the expert group, to sort of draw our attention on those groups that are competent enough players to have enough knowledge of the PFN systems as well as know how to handle data, because that way we really address both uh, uh, variables in the, equation, in the equation, which is we need to have access to data, we need to train on to use the data, but we also have to have clarity on the budget calendars, on what are the entry points within the PFM system, so that groups that have uh, knowledge can really make sure that their inputs goes in the in in the in the right places at the right moment. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Massimo. Uh, I think it is time to conclude, colleagues and friends. Uh, and thank you, Nicola, for uh, helping me in the very honorous job of chairing this session. Um, let me just start by thanking all our panelists, especially those from. Uh, the countries from Chisinau and Kampala, and of course our colleagues from London. Thank you very much for all your contributions. Thanks, uh, Nathaniel. Um, and, uh, and on behalf of the co-sponsors, uh, we from WBI, we are, we are very happy to continue to work with you with the, with the community of practice and also with our colleagues at ODI as this work moves ahead. <laughs> um, and also the great, uh, the bigger boost community. It's, it's bigger than just WBI, as uh, Massimo has been uh, uh, stressing through this morning uh, and finally to thank our communications team for helping us put the event together and make sure that uh, everything runs smoothly thank you very much I think I'm supposed to conclude by saying that the boost open data portal is now officially launched thank you very much <laughs>